Joey Carbstrong in the Rams Den. In the Rams Den. I'm in Rams You're Den. You're in the Rams Den. Literally, the first person to ever be here. Actually, I'm going to pop that on. <laughs> I'm glad like a ram is actually a herbivore because otherwise I'd be quite nervous right now. It's pretty mad to, for you to be the first guest here, isn't it? I feel, <laughs> I feel privileged. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. It's awesome, dude. So, dude, I, I tell you what, let, let's, let's take it from the top. That you, everyone watching this knows who you are. Right, but if they don't, let's like quickly set the tone. So you're probably best known for being on national TV. And actually, give me a second. Mate, the I thought you looked different. Nightmare. I was like, who is this imposter? <laughs> I'm just not. I'm so not used to doing these in person. It's like I'm all over the fucking place. All right, so um, best known probably for being on national TV multiple times in the UK. I'd say that's probably where most of your notoriety is from, right? Like probably the height of it being with Piers Morgan, maybe? I think when it, you know, back then, yes. Mm. Not so much now, yeah. um, because I, my views are quite high actually for social media. Mm. And most people will say, I, I know you're from social media these okay. days, but yeah, I do, back then, when I right. wasn't such so big on social media, yeah, that was, like, that was pretty big time for me. I suppose that was like millions of people. And now, yeah, you're hitting millions and millions now across like Facebook, Instagram. Um, YouTube as well, right? Yeah. So it's like, and all for animal rights activism, which in, in and of itself is like so fucking hard, right? <laughs> to get on TV, to get on radio, to get millions of hits across all social media for talking about animal rights is just like unheard of. So Ex yeah. that's you. Exactly. Right? That's not talking about my story or mm. myself or yada yada. It's talking about gas chambers, factory farming, animals being raped in the dairy industry. On morning the, TV. The, on morning TV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 awesome, but that's not what we're here to talk about, and that's what we're gonna we're gonna do something different, aren't what? we? Because that's normally what you talk <laughs> about, right? But that's not what we're doing today. So what I wanted to do today is give people something that they've not had before from you. So like, who's the man behind the mic, right? Who, who's the man behind the activist? Who who was Joey Carbstrong before Joey Carbstrong? Because that's not that's not you've always been. That's that's only since what when you kicked off like 2015, right? Am I right? Yep. 2015, right? So. What what about before then? And also what about now? Like you're not always Joey Carbstrong, the animal rights activist, are you? I don't actually see myself as Joey Carbstrong <laughs> the way people see me online actually. Yeah. Like, that's me at work, really. Yeah. 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 And that, that's all that everybody sees, right? Mm. And I, I've I've seen a big lack of the other side. Mm. When I, when you're interviews, I mean you've done podcasts, you've done interviews across you know, with other vegans and also on media and stuff like that. And yeah, your past sometimes comes up, but not that's never usually in like the way you actually get to talk about it. It's usually in the way of like, I'm going to fucking pin you to the wall on this. I'm going to use it against you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's awesome to have you here in person and it's a get into something like this because it's going to be more personal, right? It's, it's a nicer thing to discuss um, face to face as opposed to like over online. So, mm. so let's start with then... Let's 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 go for something an area that I know you're going to be totally comfortable with, pre Joey Carbstrong days. What what how 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 did who was Joey before all this Joseph Armstrong? Uh, <laughs> Joseph. Because <laughs> you are you always Joey? It's always been I've always been Joey. Okay, sweet. The only people that call me Joseph is my mum when she's upset with me or the police. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like equally dangerous. Though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Equal amounts of trouble, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so growing up, then, like, from take take us from the start, like, what you know, what were you into? What was life? And I know some of this is dark, so you know, go into it if if, yeah. if you want to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, talk me through it. So, I'm from a place called Powerful Gardens in northern suburbs of South Australia, and I had a kind of a. I'd call it a broken home. Father split up with my mum. Had an interesting childhood. I remember having a lot of nightmares, things like this, but mm. I was a peculiar child. Mm. I was used to think like outside the box and question like life at like seven years old, you know what I mean? Like, And um, I just remember thinking differently to a lot of other people, thinking really deep about things. And mm. I guess I consider myself a bit of a philosopher and I've, it was like innate. I was like an innate person who yeah. philosophized you know had a lot of introspection at a young age but um I, i'm not sure like why i went off the rails but i in school i didn't 
listen to authority. I was a class clown. I think I have ADHD. Now, later years, I know, looking back, I had ADHD. I couldn't focus, but I was quite clever. So, you know, I could um, learn and comprehend quite easily. And I learned how to read without knowing to, you know, without having too much trouble, but also I couldn't focus. So it was very right. weird. So like, I felt like I was higher functioning, quite intelligent, like I could pick up things quite mm. easily, but didn't want to learn in the classroom, right. listen to the teacher. I'd rather make fun of the teacher and then get sent out of class. Yeah. And uh, rebellious in primary school. Uh, I remember having a lot of fist fights in primary school. And, you know, so I was, you know, mm. I had it in me. Yeah. Like, it, was, it wasn't just um, the gang culture that kind of, conditioned me as a youngster i, w I was kind of like peculiar adhd class clown and also a bit of a fighter right you know right. what i mean so it's probably a combination of of like the you know broken family never helps and then plus adhd plus teachers not understanding how to deal with the adhd yeah you put all that together and it's no surprise that things could go off yeah. the rails right well i didn't have a real because my dad I, uh, I love my dad but he wasn't in the house Mm. So if there was someone else in the house, I, I wouldn't show them respect. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. I guess like not having a father figure in the house that I showed respect to, yeah. that I respected, I was like, who am I going to listen to? Yeah. You know? Yeah, but totally. I, once I got to like 14, 15, so 14, 15, I um, was in high school. I did one year of high school, year eight. And then when year nine come along, which was I was about 14 for year nine, I, I started hanging around with uh, one of my mates at school. Mm. He used to shave his head. At that, at that stage, right, around that stage, I was a skateboarder. Right. So I was right. going to this place called Skate FX. I had a mad vibe there. They were like a kind of, I would consider them hippie-ish, right. like really peace and love. Like stoners kind of thing. Yeah, or just like, yeah, really spiritual kind of, I don't know how else to describe it, but they were, they taught me a lot actually mm. about like, just heaps of different things, you know. They were just more laid back and, like, I loved being there and I yeah. become a really good skateboarder, become, was sponsored as a skateboarder. But I used to smoke weed all the time. Right. But we weren't harming anyone. We would, we would do it there yeah. and I felt completely safe there. There was no bad people there sure, that were misleading sure. us, you know what I mean? So we were just smoking weed and skateboarding and having fun. It was like a little playground for us and it was really, actually, it was some of the best years of my life, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I consider it one of the safest most enlightening stages of my life being there. It was when I left that safe place right, right. and started hanging out with the street dudes um, through a, fr a friend of mine at school and they were shaving heads and, and they were boxers and right. they were quite tough actually. And I was not so tough. I realized right. that I wasn't so tough at that point <laughs> that uh, like these, these kids were quite savage, mate. And they were 15 to 17, but they were... They were operating on the streets. They were doing like, uh, you know, breaking into cars. Like they would, it was something called rolling someone, which is essentially just mm. um, bashing someone for their money. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, it's like robbery. And, uh, you know, but drinking alcohol, boxing, fighting. That was the, those type of kids that I started to mix with and I stopped skateboarding. Right. And that's where I started to like get like reality checks. Like uh, I was getting bullied a bit at the start. Right. You know, and uh, I was quite a pure dude like pure in my heart like i wasn't like like cruel right you know what right, I mean? right right yeah so i was like quite victimized at the start actually right but uh it's weird because like you get beaten up by your friends and you still want to hang out with them it's it's a bizarre thing like yeah yeah because i like i liked it being around them i felt cool being around them but i was also getting beaten up and, and bullied a bit right you just want to prove yourself a little bit as well yeah well i don't know i've just mm. just had no step like no boundaries, no standards, just allowed myself to get right. walked over a little bit. Okay, okay. Um, but it toughened me up. It actually toughened me up. It actually prepared me for my enemies that mm. I was going to find. Like, you know, with friends like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Wait till Shit, you, yeah. you know. So anyways, it was, uh, it was good for me to, 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 to toughen up a right. little bit, you know what I mean? Right, so, right. It could have been like also, I guess, with, I, I also grew up with, no dad in the house, right? So I, I kind of know what that's like. And I guess you look to other places for the, I don't know, the masculine kind of input. And I suppose if, if you're hanging out with these guys who are really oh, manly and they're beating you up, you kind of look past it because you're like, well, you know, this is this is the input. This is where I'm getting it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I feel like maybe it's something like that. Kind of like looking for that kind of what's missing, mm. you know, maybe. That's pretty fucking deep yeah. for like five minutes into the podcast. Though. <laughs> no, but it is, it is. You do look for father figures outside right, of father. But right. not to 
downplay my father. I love my dad. Right. And uh, yeah. my dad, like I speak highly of my dad. He just was in a situation that he couldn't be around the house. Oh, sure. Because okay. it's between him and my mother. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't because he was a scumbag. He really did care for us. And okay. when we did see him, it was the best thing ever. But like, it was just hard. You know, yeah. it's, it's complicated. Yeah. It's yeah. not as easy as just, your dad should be at the house all the time. Well, if they're, if it's World War Three. Then it's yeah, probably better yeah, that he's yeah, not yeah. there. You know sure, what I mean? Totally. Because totally. my dad is punching my mum's boyfriend in the head or something. You know what I mean? It's not. <laughs> right. It's not a good environment. So he probably thought it's best that I'm not there. Probably. You know? yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, So enough. anyway, like this isn't a like my parents. I love my mum too. Like they're legends. My my mum and dad are legends. They're, they've done so much for me. So I don't want to sit here and like bag on them. Yeah. It's no, just I get it, I get it's it. just like where I'm from. Most families are like this. Okay. Like when when someone says to me. Oh, my mum and dad are both in the house. I'm like, well, that's just unusual for me. Like mm. 80% of the people I know where I'm from come from broken homes. Same. That's just very normal. Same, same. So like- when, usually associated yeah. with like low income. As yeah, well, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mum was on, um, we call it pension in Australia, yeah, but we, it's like welfare. Yeah. It's social. You know? Yeah, we call yeah, it social. Yeah, yeah, Mum's yeah. on pension and, you know, and uh, most families are like that. Like, I, like to have both parents working yeah. where I'm from is very- unusual like mum was scrounging up five dollars which is like 250 quid or something to put petrol in the car right you know what right. i'm saying yeah like yeah. we didn't get money we were we did it hard like uh we she, we, she, we had food in the cupboard and that was it yeah. but my mum was very strict like you know so she she kind of smothered us you know mm. she didn't let us do stuff like go places or have like she 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 was pinching pennies yeah. so she would like be so protective of us that like you know it wasn't like it wasn't e that's probably the reason i left home mm. you know because i left home for a few different reasons like one i didn't like there was some stuff going on in the house i didn't agree with and i didn't um i, I would fight with my mum's partner at the time and i fought with my mum mm. and she was trying to control me and i was like nah and there was no one to stop me basically right. and i was like catch you later i'm going and then i started hanging out with um a couple of guys that weren't in the street kids another guy that was like older older right. older like 27 and i'm like 15 i went down and stayed at his house for like three months right right and then i started like using drugs quite a lot and um you know they were all injecting drugs actually so they were all like okay. yeah they were all injecting like drugs and stuff like that and uh that's i started hanging out with that that's type of crew older like 10 years older than me yeah. you know what i mean but yeah, they were yeah, like yeah. they were tough dudes but they're older than my mates so you yeah, know like I had different groups of friends. I was there for three months. And so basically young age, like super still brain still developing. And I'm just starting to get more and more hectic. Mm. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, I'm starting to do things that most 15 year olds aren't doing. Even, um, sorry, 15 year olds in my friend group weren't even doing, you know, so. Right, right, right. So yeah, and then I left there and started, to, you know, developing my bond with my other mates. If she's watching, how's it going? <laughs> but like, you know, started boxing, started like, um, you know, street stuff and started getting street fights and that and right. earning a reputation for myself. You know what I mean? Right, right. And then that's that's that went on for a bit, right? So, dude, we used to do some crazy stuff, mate. Like we would, we were hectic kids. Mm. And the people who were older, like say 30, 40, used to like underestimate us. And that would be a very big mistake on their behalf because they would, um, they would look at us like little punks and right. then they would be on the floor pissing blood out of their head. Like, cause we would smash their heads in really badly. Right. Eight ball cues, bottles. Um, I've left people sitting inside of a chip rock wall with their head split open for trying to hit my little brother. And right. this was like a 40 year old man. You know what I mean? Yeah, Snap the pool yeah. cue over his head, and I was sixteen, seventeen. Right. You know that's the we 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 would put people in their place, and we or, and there was like twelve of us, and we all knew how to box. We all were drunk, mm. and we're all extremely violent, and um, that's how we would rock up to parties. You know what I mean? Right. And, yeah. <laughs> There's a far far cry away from the um, hippie skaters, huh? Fucking hell. Yeah. No. No. Exactly. And, and yeah. we didn't get up to any of that stuff at. Skate effects, right? You know, where right. we, we, we were skateboarding, it was all they were teaching us about. You know, I remember one thing like uh, about my, my lovely friends at Skate Effects, they taught us about like homophobia as okay. well, yeah. And that's one lesson we would never learn where in, on the streets where I'm from, right? And I, I remember that, like, I remember that lesson because someone, someone that was around us said something homophobic, right? And they said, don't ever in this, in this place speak down like that on gay men yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah our friend and 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 uh, a couple of gay guys were sponsoring us giving us clothes through their skate shop too and it just taught me about i was like wow is that wrong you right, know? right it's another thing like um they found out one of us was like harming a cat right and they were like don't harm a cat 
don't harm out. You know what I mean? Like, they right, okay, you yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like whereas, like, <laughs> you probably wouldn't have got that lesson anywhere else. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get you. And it was interesting because um, one of them was actually a vegetarian. Mm. And I remember, offer, like, talking about, oh, this amazing steak. I was only, like, 13. I didn't know. And she was like, why would you tell me that? Right, like, why would right. you tell me yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. You had to, yeah. like, she, wow, And I was like, yeah. what did I do? What? what? Oh, then I thought, and she goes, yeah, I'm a vegetarian. So, like, right. you know. Those type of seeds in my head, yeah, like now yeah, they're coming yeah, back yeah. to me. I was like, well, maybe these these help me with the justice side of it. Don't hurt the cats mm. with the vegetarian thing. Maybe they were seeds that are just in my subconscious. But sure. but yeah, the the street gang stuff was a far cry from from the skate effects. Even though I had access to drugs at skate effects, mm. I didn't have access to the environment. It's the environment right, right, that, right, that right. was way different, and that's right. where um most of the blood baths happen in the environment, you know, you, yeah. you, it's like you mix, mix a bunch of violent people up with alcohol and drugs mm. and egos and see who comes out on top. And that's, that was the, the streets. And that's, so you went from, so, so you went from innocent Joey, just figuring the world out to slightly less innocent Joey getting stoned and skating, but still relatively innocent to this mad gang violence, blood guts, the whole lot. To then back now, to more or less innocent Joey. Well, no, right? no. Well, there's levels to this. <laughs> or is there, or is there, there's or is there levels, like there's levels to this street stuff. So, like when I was hanging out with the, the street crew, shaving yeah. their heads, boxing, that's a level. That's just then. Then we become then around um, nineteen twenty. Yeah, we with another group of guys become a well-established street crew organized all right and we had our own clubhouse so this was this was this was like how many years of, of being kind of so in from that 15 world to uh, 19 like and i'd, I'd at that wow, stage okay. i'd committed um violent crime stabbings ba like bashings all the time bottling people um you know i'd had my own my arm broken in, in being bashed i'd been kicked in i'd been split up myself um so some people do this as like kind of like a, they go off the rails for like a, a year or so but this no, was no, like this was a like real kind this of this was a lifestyle bro right this right. was a lifestyle and i was taking um meth and ecstasy and alcohol all the time i was selling starting to sell ecstasy and you know just brutal brutal street violence but then i become a uh, part of a organized street gang right? right which is like they were kind of the big boys but they weren't they weren't the the big gangsters right but we were pretty established and pretty respected by the big gangsters if you know what i mean mm. so we had our own clubhouse and that and we were we were more like more t t targeted and like dangerous and organized if you right, if you know right. what i'm saying yeah and um yeah that's what what that evolved into and everything sort of steps up mm -hmm. you know then i start getting my hands on you know firearms this and that and um then it's, it's a bit different you know then yeah. I'm, i start uh i start selling drugs you know what i mean because that's how you make we don't work we don't work where I'm from. I don't even know what career path I would have had. I was working up mm. until I was doing like warehouse jobs, you know, but then I, I, about 20 years old, I just quit everything. And I just started like trying to make, make money selling drugs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what everyone was doing. And that's quick money. Yeah. It's a very stupid way to make money. It's incredibly high risk. You end up using your drugs you end up people owing you money and you end up more violent than you were because yeah. you have to use violence to intimidate and to get money back. This is the, if you know anything about the drug world, that's it's based on it's based on violence and intimidation, and you know basically yeah, making yeah. short term money at a very high risk. It's a, it's the stupidest way to make money actually nowadays. You got the internet and stuff, but yeah. that's all we knew back then. So with that comes uh, the police. You know, you're watching the police, you're watching your back. Then you've got more enemies, and people are credibly jealous of you if you start making money too in that right, world because right, everyone's right. broke. You know what I mean? So that there's that that's another level, right? And then what happens is this this the the highest level of gangs in Australia. I'm not going to say any names or anything like that, but <clears throat> they're very well known. You could just go look it up yourself. Yeah. Especially around 2012, look up in Adelaide. What's going on there? Like this isn't a joke. This is very very serious. People people were getting killed off the back of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's not it's it's incredibly uh, dangerous stuff. Um, it, it, shocking. If you're not used to it, that's for sure. But yeah. you build you build your way up to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah. I, I lived with a a high ranking um, gang member. You know of of the big boys. You mm -hmm. know, like for two years. So I was kind of like initiated by association kind of thing 
incredibly like absolute legend um really nice guy but obviously you know you don't want to mess with him either you know right. what i mean and uh then what ended up happening is ice uh, our street gang ended up forming into a like being taken over by a a higher level organized crime gang, a very established Australia wide gang. Right. And they took our, our gang and, and turned it into a bigger thing. Right. And then there was a, the danger level become higher. Um, there was, there's obviously gangs fight with each other. There's wars, mm. there's shootings. There's, um, it's just, everything's on another level. It's inc- yeah. the danger levels a lot higher. So, so you went through all of that then. <laughs> She sounds fucking insane. And I think even even though you've only given like a quick snapshot of it, I think it's already insane enough. I mean, we could do a whole podcast literally about all of the experiences in just itself. But so that I think what's most interesting at this point is with you being so like entrenched in that, you're like you were like in that and you were living that and that's life and it's growing and growing and growing. And how, so, so you, you've spoken before, like when you spoke with Piers Morgan, you said, I turned my life around and, and you do say that usually when someone says, Hey, you used to do this, you say, well, I turned it around, but I don't think I've ever heard you actually explain like step by step. What, what, what started to happen? Like when did the, the, the seeds start going in that, that this is not, there's something better, there's something bigger because now you, you fight every day for something that's bigger than all of us, right? You, you completely changed your head mind space from what do I do to get what I want to what can I do for others? Right. Yeah. So so tell me, like, tell me the first moment where you started to like. What is there a specific memory where you started to be like, this isn't this isn't right, you know? Or, uh, like, that's a good. That's an extremely good question. Mm. And all I can say is it happened in stages. Do you know how yeah. when people go vegan and they see one thing and they might have had this uh, this angry response about it, and then they, yeah. they, it comes in little seeds and little stages, and it's never. The people that you sit down with, they go vegan straight away. They've been thinking about yeah, this for quite, last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? They've seen yeah, something. Yeah. They just needed that little totally. push. Totally. And that's exactly how unindoctrinating myself from that world happened. Right. It was the biggest thing that happened to me was when I, I got caught. I was on the run. And while I was on the run, uh, the cops were looking for me. They, they, they found a firearm in the back of a car and they tried to pin it on me, a back of right. the car that I was driving. And they said it was mine. It wasn't mine. Um, they tried to nail me for it and then i i was afraid of the police so i went on the run right yeah i was drug fueled anyway i was like ah if the police i'm not gonna <laughs> they're gonna have to catch me i'm on a bender so but this is the most significant time in my life right mm-hmm. I, i'm i'm basically um in this so so basically the, they were looking for me for a gun in the car that wasn't mine yeah but i ended up getting in some altercation with people that I was friends with. Right. And uh, I ended up arming myself up. Okay. All right. And because, uh, you know, my friends, they were pretty hectic. Right, like right, people. right. They're not, they're not. Yeah. You know, I was friends with some dangerous, dangerous, you know, people. So I, I was I was armed up um, with a pump action 22. Looks like a little shotgun. That's why people mm. say, oh, you got caught with a shotgun. It's, it's actually a pump action 22 rifle. Uh, and I had it down my trousers and I was still on the run from the police. The, p- the police were coming with, with like a SWAT team to my mum's house, kicking in a bloody door with a uh, bulletproof vest on, putting their feet on the table, harassing my mum. Yeah, yeah. My grandpa uh, was dying of cancer. He had just died, right? Mm. And the police knew he died. So they seen the funeral notice on my uh, fridge mm. that uh, from a prior raid. So they came on the morning of his funeral. They knew I was going to come there. Right. Well, they assumed I would, you know. So they, I, I arrived at my mum's four four in the morning one morning, and they had just left. And mum's like, "What are you doing? The police have been looking for you, right?" Mm. And uh, mum had my suit laid out on the on the couch and that, and I was just like, "Boom!" I, I left again, and that's when I got. Uh, I went to a hotel. Right. And that's when I got uh, busted by the police. They found us at the hotel. They thought we were breaking into a car. It was the girl's car. She left the keys in it. Seriously, though, we weren't breaking into a car. And uh, they, they found the gun. But then when I went to, they, they locked me straight up and put me in G Division. And that's when, like, the reality, that was one of the probably the biggest, like, things that put hit you in, me. In what, sorry? In... They put me in G Division, which What's is, that? it's a, so in, in Yatla Prison, there's a couple of different units. You've got B Division, you've right, got right. F Division, which is a working unit. G Division is, like, solitary. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Solitary confinement is, okay. yeah, the whole, uh, right. like Americans will know it as the whole, I don't know what they call solitary it. Solitary confinement. Solitary. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, they chucked me in there, but they chucked me in there because of my mental health issues because I was unstable. Because right. I was like, are you going to hurt yourself? And I looked like i have been on a five-day bender because I had been. So they, were, they put me in there to ob uh, under observation. Right, right. Because there's cameras in there. They put you. They take all your clothes off. You give you, give you like this potato sack. Mm. And I was coming down off drugs. My grandpa just died, and I love my grandpa. I, I actually, my middle name is Dominic, named after my grandpa. Um, yeah, and I was just coming down, and I was mourning him, and I was like... It was just the most horrible experience of my life. Like, and I'm pretty mentally tough, but that was, it was a combination of coming down off of all the drugs, mm. mourning my grandpa, and I'd been on a rampage. So I'd been doing horrible things. I'd been not a good friend. I'd been a bad family member. Mm. Like, you know, I, I just, I was just like, started to feel so much shame and guilt and sober mind, and I was stuck in a tiny box. They were feeding me through a gap, microwaved sandwiches. I didn't know how had they had spit on them or whatever because mm. in, in Yatla, all the uh, sex offenders make the food. Right. Okay. Yeah, so they're probably spitting in the – who knows what they're doing to the food. Like it's, and, and you have to make your bed pack twice a day and spit shine clean the entire floor and get all the fingerprints off or they will bash you. Like right, the, right. The, the guards in, in Yatla prison, if you, if you raise your hand like that to scratch your nose, they will smash your hand down. If you don't listen to them two or three times, they'll take that as a threat and right. they, they will – they will attack you. Right, so it's right. not, it's, it's like five days in there. It was no joke. And um, luckily my lawyer got me home debail and I got bailed out of there. But that was, that five days lasted like a marathon. Right, right. I remember the other prisoners yelling going, don't worry, mate, this isn't what jail's like, bro. Like just r trying to like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the worst part of the prison, mate. Like, don't worry about it. Hey. Like if you go to the mainstream, you'll be all right. Never wanted to be in mainstream more in my entire life, yeah, eh? Yeah. But, um, yeah, when I went on house arrest now and I chucked on a bunch of weight, got really depressed. And I, I'm talking about I was an obese, angry, depressed, psychologically unstable, you know, person. Right. Still pretty damn violent, right? But, mm. I, I mean, I was – me and you put together nearly in weight, so like 115 kilos. And and I just I just remember having enough one day and looking for a diet to lose weight. And this is when like, when, when I found this guy on uh, YouTube, Dan the Life Regenerator, he's a raw foodist. Mm -hmm. He's not, I wouldn't call him a vegan, I'd call him more of this, like a raw food educator. Sure. Was a spiritual dude. Um, when I, when I did he took his advice and drank this big green juice, right? I remember drinking it. Like you remember, I'm, drink, I'm eating um, Burger King, bacon, pork chops, oil in the morning, just like, just greasy shit. I'm, yeah. I'm taking meth. I'm drinking alcohol, I'm obese, I, I'm taking like sedatives and stuff to go to sleep. When I, when I drank this green juice, it was like so revitalized. Like I, I can, I've never felt the feeling ever, ever before, like ever again. That was like, that was like I had just ingested some ma magical drug and I felt like I could just levitate. I was, it just filled me with like, I was looking up at the sky and I had tingles, man. Yeah, and it was fruits yeah. and vegetable juice, dude. <laughs> fruits and vegetable. I was like, this guy's so right. And that, and that, I think what it did, right? It made me. It gave me clarity. Mm. It was weird. Like, like I was still on the drugs and stuff, but it gave me this weird clarity. Right. And it made me start to think rationally again. I was like, yeah, yeah. So, but then I was still, I was a full fledged member of an uh, outlaw organized crime gang mm -hmm. at that point on house arrest. You know, I was still not to be messed with, I was still committing allegedly extreme acts of uh, violence mm. while on house arrest with people that were just in my house, you know, I, right. I, you know, so I was dangerous, man. Like, I, like you can sit here with me now, but other people would sit with me. They wouldn't know what I was going to do. Right. I was incredibly unpredictable and they didn't know whether like, this, this is the game. You don't know in that world whether someone's your best friend or your worst enemy and you won't know till it's too late. Right. That's the, that's the world. It's constant gaslighting. It's constant, um, people setting you up treachery mm. and this could be your friends or these can be people pretending to be friends you the whole time till they get you yeah. and and you have to play that game if people are robbing you they're not going to come and you act like angry with them they're not going to come and see you right if they've robbed you you got to you got to say come down i want to talk to you about it. it's all good mm -hmm. you know what i mean this is that world so that's why it's so scary that's why <laughs> you get a call from a mate hey come down you're like have I done anything, said anything? Did I get too drunk? What did I say the other night? Is everything all right, bro? Yeah, no, it's all good, bro. And then you come in there, 50-50 chance that it's all good. Um, Sounds like a fucking anxiety nightmare, basically. For someone who's anxious, it's exactly like the worst. Exactly that. Exactly. Exa and I had bad anxiety. Right, exactly right. that. That's why you got to drink 
alcohol and take drugs all the time. Right, right. <laughs> it's just to deal with <laughs> daily shit. But basically, it was the the biggest change for me was being was removing me from the environment because on house arrest it it sort of limited my environment, right. which is a blessing because so much stuff happened while I was on house arrest. Horrible war going on, so there's stuff mm. that I could have been involved in with, but I'm grateful that I wasn't because I was on house arrest. Mm. And I wasn't stupid enough to, to cut my bracelet off because I already had that experience in G Division. I was right, like, I'm not going back to G Division. Right, right, you know what I mean? Right. So it stopped me from cutting my bracelet off and running because on house arrest, you've, if people don't know, you've got an electronic bracelet on, you can't leave the house, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, because uh, G Division, it was weird. If I didn't have G Division, I would have snipped my bracelet off and ran away. Right. But right, G right. Division was like enough for me to go, nah, I'm, I'll stay at home. I think that's why they do it. G Division? Not I think it's part of, part of the reason to kind of try and scare you straight, basically. Yeah, but most people, it makes them worse. Oh, uh, true. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, most people, it makes them more violent and harder to deal with. It the way would, they treat it would, make, it would fucking make me never, never do anything yeah, but you're ever a different again. Type. <laughs> you're a different You're like, you're a different type of person. Uh, imagine if you've been institutionalized for 10 years and then sure, they put you in G, G Division. Sure, you're sure. just going to hate. fucking hate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah totally. There's a lot of human rights stuff that go oh. on in jail that, that no okay. one will find out about because the prisoners don't talk about it. Because mm. prisoners don't snitch. Yeah, sure. And there's sure. Like horrible stuff that happens to prisoners by the guards all the time. Uh, and then just it never makes it to the outside, which is sad. Like it stopped you in your tracks, right? It's like almost kind of forced you to meditate on stuff, didn't it? In a way, like because you because you can't. What else are you gonna do? You have to fucking sit there and think. You can't even kill yourself. And the, the idea of G division is to put you in observation in case you commit. So you, even if you wanted to escape, you can't. <laughs> right, right. You are forced literally, like, because that's why they put me in there because I was unstable, you know. Mm, so mm. there's camera on you twenty four seven. You're in a potato sack it's just what else are you gonna do right? you just gotta think and the sobering up I can imagine that was fucking brutal as yeah, well yeah and the way I just you know it was just like a massive shame party in there with <laughs> yeah, myself yeah. like just oh god this it was torture but um, when, I, when I was on so I did my 18 months house arrest and then I got my prison sentence and they put me inside and um, you know I was inside as a full gang member mm. and uh, you know prison for gang members is you, you know you're safe from prisoners but you're also up against other gangs who right, are right. often <laughs> a lot more crazy than me <laughs> so and if you go to the wrong unit where the other gangs are you know it's it's pretty jail's a pretty tough place uh, you know you got to keep your wits about you so i never didn't use it there's drugs available in jail mm. obviously i didn't take any drugs in jail okay. stay completely sober train twice a day and this is where the mental clarity come okay you know what i mean because on house arrest yes I, my environment had changed but when i went to prison my environment completely changed, but yeah, what, what else changed? I stopped putting drugs inside of my brain. You know what I mean? So I have a combination now. In prison, I was using um, I was using fruits and vegetables on my because once I get to, got out of uh, Yatla, you could buy fruits and vegetables. Okay. Yatla's a uh, maximum security prison. I went to a medium security prison. I'm eating lots of fruits and vegetables mm. there, and I was still eating chicken breast and skim milk powder for protein. But this high amount of plant food, mm. sobriety, right? And a lot of time to think made me start to philosophize again. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So that, that inner inter introspective philosophizing kid come back. And I started thinking like, because when you're around people that are doing life, right, mm. for punching someone, right, they punch someone at a party. Let's just, it can happen to anyone. Yeah. You get in yeah. a party, you're drunk, you throw a punch. You know, where I'm from, mate, do you know how many times we threw punches and we kick people, uh, you know, on yeah. the floor and... Gang fights happen all the time where I'm from. It's just normal bottles smashing my, my... I've got stitches on my head. I've been knocked out by Jack Daniels bottles. I've been run over in a car, nearly died. It's just knives flying past you. This stuff happens all the time. Yeah, but yeah. I'm now when you go to prison, you see the people doing life in there. Mm. They're doing 10 years. They're doing eight years. Like I'm like, I don't know if I want to do six months in here. <laughs> You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, like, of course. I don't yeah. want to wake up tomorrow in here. Was, that your, was your thing six months? I got six months. Yeah, six months. Okay. Yeah, I got 13 months on the top, six months on the bottom okay. um, for carrying the gun. A yeah, couple of other yeah. little small things, but it was quite a good... I got I got let off quite lightly. Yeah, my sounds lawyer, like it. My lawyer was... Uh, <laughs> it sounds yeah. considering, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my lawyer was just... I was always respectful to my lawyer. Mm. You know what I mean? I always treated, talked to him because I was like, this guy's... They're going to help me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. And other, I don't know, other criminals for a fact... Talking to the lawyers like, like idiot, like they're treating with contempt, and I'm like, yeah, these people yeah, are yeah, helping yeah. you. They can try hard or <laughs> not try, not no, so not, hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember I always talked to my lawyers with respect. You know what I mean? And mm. and, and it, it did pay off, and they did. I think they went into to bat for me. Um, but anyway, you you understand like like even six months is too long in jail. You right. know what I mean? It's just not a good place to be in. And that, like the the people that do 
oh, it's like bless the people who get ten years, eight, eight years for like a for like a weed charge like, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Growing weed and there's people in there that are getting fifteen years. Like I don't know, weed never really harmed anyone unless oh. unless it was a drug deal gone wrong or something like that. But in terms of it yeah, being I, a harmful I, substance, not really. I find it pretty it, mad. People sometimes get like thirty years for like or twenty years for like fraud, and then a rapist gets three. I don't get that. You know what I mean? The Stuff judges like that. corrupt. I don't know. Right, yeah, yeah, judge, yeah, Judges yeah. don't mind too much about this, you know. Anyway, yeah. but uh, yeah, so it was in prison where I started to fully start seeing things from like this bird's eye perspective and start mm. looking over everything. And I started analyzing my life from like this timeline. Mm -hmm. It's weird. My mind started like, you do that. You could be like, I started having like these different timelines and like uh, there was reality of like what can actually happen to you if you get caught and i was mm -hmm. thinking to myself Matt, like you know yeah i got caught for that like imagine if i got caught for this or that or like imagine if i actually went through and did that and i got caught right yeah i wouldn't like imagine now like now i've been out for 10 years i could still be in there and have another 15 to go right yeah you know what i mean imagine man fuck you know i've got friends doing life for yeah. murders yeah. you know what i mean it's 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 inc it's shocking and it's incredibly sad like they're good people you know mm. they got mixed it's hard to sounds weird saying that but yeah. I, I know these people yeah they got it's a bad environment they got mixed up you know it's it's horrible what what, what can happen in that world but it can happen sure everyone's sure. kind of in the same boat here we're all mm, tr trying to shoot each other trying to do this <laughs> to each other you know what i mean yeah and um you can get you know so anyway i, I want to go too far off track but it's uh it's a crazy world where things can happen just at the sure, sure. blink of an eye and you could lose your entire freedom for the rest of your life over a stupid mindset you were in in 2010. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, got it, and got now it. look at me now, like completely different outlook on everything. Yeah. So yeah, it was, a, it was a prison, it was a sobriety and then upon release being on parole where they were testing my urine mm. for drugs, right, mainly, that, that kept me out and then kept me sober enough to go, I don't want to go back to prison and the gangs were getting so crazy at that point. Right. I, I was like visiting friends in hospital from a bit, a bit after gang violence, you know what I mean? And mm. just like, just looking at them like, oh my God, bro, like you are the toughest dude I've ever met. And if they can do that to you, what would, what would, what would happen to me? Right. I'm, right. I'm half the size of you, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's stabbings yeah. happening, happening, there's shootings happening, there's people having broken arms and legs and this and that. And like, and I'm just thinking, what am I going to do on parole? I don't even have access to a gun. I'm like riding my push bike around. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. like, it was just, it just come to the point where I was like, I'm not in, I'm, my heart's not in this anymore. Sure. You know, sure. if you're in a, if you're a part of an organization, you better, you better be ready to die. You better be ready to like do anything. Mm -hmm. If you're not, then you're not in it. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a weak link. So I thought the best thing to do at that point it's just to walk away and hope for the best. And then at that point, when you walk away, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You don't have anyone to call if someone comes knocking on your door. No. I, I was never going to call the police. And I was definitely, that, that, at that point, I felt like a naked target. Mm. Yeah, I bet. Scariest how, time of my life. How old life. are you at this point? Like, so this point now, you've, you're I got out, out of prison, you... uh, 20, uh, I think I was 26 when I got out. Right. Uh, so I was 26 and I had... November the 1st, mm. so I got out in October 2013, I think, and November the 1st uh, was the day that I decided to go vegan. Right. After a conversation with my mum about smoking, and she was like, look at yourself, and I was like, I always said I was a hypocrite for eating animals, and I just went vegan the next day. It was World Vegan Day. Um, I put it down to fate. The skeptics will disagree. <laughs> but uh, then, um, yeah, like that month was my birthday, my 27th, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I still... When they released me from prison, right, they put you on parole, but they put me on two months of house arrest. Right. So with the bracelet again, but I'm on parole. So I spent another birthday and another Christmas on house arrest. That was mm. three. Mm -hmm. So it was... Okay. Yeah. 2011, I got busted with a gun. I spent that, that birthday and Christmas on, on house arrest. Then 2012, birthday, Christmas, I went to prison. And then uh, 2030, uh, 13, birthday and Christmas on house arrest. So it was three. Birthday Christmas is on house arrest. Right. On my right. third um, Christmas on house arrest, I made a vegan uh, animal rights post. Okay. On right. 2013, I was Shit. talking about the, the turkeys that are caged. 
and I was calling all the meat eaters bastards for, you know, <laughs> but I said it in jest, but that was my like. Yeah, yeah, that was like your, your intro to everything. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was outspoken from day dot. And mm. um, like I said to you, when I left the gangs, I was it. That was it. I was by mm. myself then. And I was, uh, and, I, and then it was like when, you, when you're in a tornado, right? You're in a tornado. You don't actually know you're in a tornado till I pull you out of it. Right. Because you get right. so used to that swirling, mm. the sound and all this stuff flinging past mm. you. When I pull you out of it, you're still going to be spinning a little bit. And that's PTSD. Right. That's, right. The, that's the trauma. You don't trust anyone. You don't, you're looking at cop cars. You're, you're having nightmares, violent nightmares. You don't know where to go. You don't know who you're going to see. Your phone mm. rings. You get anxiety. Who's it going to be? What's going on? You're watching the news. You're doing this. That's, uh, that's PTSD from you can't, you can't go through 10 years mm. of craziness, pull yourself out sober and just think, I eat fruits and vegetables now. I'm going to be all right. You know what I mean? It's yeah, uh, way no, deeper it, than yeah. that. So Totally. You know what's interesting is that, and um, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't get the impression that you are, that you feel sorry for yourself or that you feel even kind of like, like some people have been through what you've been through. They sit in a podcast, right? Or they'll sit on an interview and they'll be like, yeah, man, oh my God, I was, I was such a bad person. And it's all self-hate, self-hate. I don't get that vibe from you at all. I feel, I get the vibe that you, 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 you did it all. And I feel like you don't, see the point in, in the kind of like, oh, so, so you just kind of like it happened and move on. You've got a really interesting kind of way of speaking about it. Am I right on that? Is that, is that how you see it? Like, like you don't, because obviously we can regret, we can say you, you, you most likely would rather some of those things not happened, but what's the point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You seem I, to have kind of accepted that this is just... Yeah, don't get me you know? wrong. Like I am ashamed of my conduct, mm. but also I know the circumstances that led to it. You know, you're talking about someone who was in a horrible environment who did, who's kind of in an impossible situation. Mm. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the kids that grew up with me, they don't have mums. Their mums died of a heroin overdose. Right. You know, they don't have leaders in the mm. house. Mm -hmm. They don't have uh, education. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They don't have any other option but to sell drugs yeah. and get a gun. Because if you don't have a gun, I've got one, mate, and I'm yeah, taking your drugs. Yeah. Like, what are you supposed to do in that world? And yeah, what are you sure. supposed to do if I come and target you? You're going to call the cops and be a snitch? Mm. You've got no choice. So, like, yeah, I'm not – I understand what I did was circumstantial, but I'm still accountable. But also there's these outside factors mm -hmm. that I understand now mm -hmm. Yeah. because I was a lot more filled with shame – you know, at the start, sure. but now that I've understood all the factors and I did have, and, and I've worked through my trauma and things like this, and I understand the dynamics a lot more. And we're talking about 10 years. I haven't even punched someone in the face. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm, I'm well behind that. And been I've had been close though. A few of those, oh, few those debates, you, maybe. <laughs> I've had many opportunities. I'm telling you right now. I've had many times. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the most hated on people on the internet. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure, so man. I've been through a lot, like since I've been an activist and I, and not, there's been times where I've gone, oh, man, I'd love to just drop this guy. Like, but but it's it's so that's, that's all it's been. It's just totally, been a thought. Totally, I've never totally. I've never gone through with it because I, I don't want to go to jail. And and, no. I, and, I, and I know that I, there's other ways to if I, if I'm gonna let someone control me like that, then I've I've not grown at all. You know what I mean? Totally, so totally, totally, man. That was a that was a a real fucking. In, intricate story and in detail, and I appreciate you going through it all because it's it's uncomfortable. I imagine to, if, I mean, for some people here, and this will be uncomfortable because it is it is a very you know dark past, right? So so it's it's great that you're you're confident. That's what I meant. You're you're confident and you're explaining it. You know, you're not obviously you don't you, you're not proud of what happened, but you're also not like woe is me. Oh, you should everyone should feel sorry for me. Either. But nah. you're just kind of like this is how it was. This is the shit that it went down. This is how I came out of it. I guarantee, you, if I had that attitude, I would be back on the drugs tomorrow. You know what yeah, I mean? Because totally. I would be self pitying and I'd be saying it's everything else fault but not my own. Mm. You know, and that that's not an empowering mindset to be in no, because no. only if someone is in that world, probably not many people that are watching this. Maybe you got a brother or sister, but it, mm. it really is up to them at, at a certain point that they have to help themselves. You yeah. know, because yeah. like my family couldn't control me. They were intimidated by me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Friends around me, they they don't know how to say, like have this empathic conversation with you. Like, hey, bro, you think you're going a bit too far? They just be like, oh, you're being a dick. You know, so yeah, you, I get it. So yeah. you have to get to a point where you've hit rock bottom and go, what are my options here? Right. So so there needs to be a change, right? There needs to be, a, and it, it's not like you did. It's not just the 
oh, I'm changing, everything has to change. Like the, everyone around you, where you put yourself, where your time goes, where your where your attention goes, it all has to switch. Otherwise, environment you'll, mostly. You'll fall back in, environment right? and what you put in your body. Mm. You got to get pull yourself out of it for long enough to get some mental clarity mm. and just stay away from the environment for long yeah. enough for yeah. you to have a switch and then you need a purpose to drive off the back of like exercise you need to just ride around on a bike and get away just get away from everything don't answer your phone it's i went on like this soul journey that like i don't know just i just go on these big long ass rides 300 200ks 300ks and right. just headphones in and just i don't know like it's what it takes you got to really pull yourself out of it yeah I guess find another drug then yeah one well, that's a bit healthier Exercises for you. Yeah, yeah, best, yeah 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 totally so who do, who do you so you i imagine that you've got a lot of mental fortitude for probably from the history you've had and, and getting over this stuff but like nowadays let's say is there anyone that i don't know you look up to is there anyone that's inspiring you to stay strong or to like i'm not talking only vegan space here i'm sure there are people in the vegan space who inspire you i'm talking like you as an individual who are you taking inspiration from to like stay on and keep going strong and, and you know i don't know keep not positive but like driven because you are very driven right you, yeah, you, yeah. you, you speak driven. in a very driven way yeah, yeah. so are there, are there things that you're reading or things that you're listening to or people you're looking to that are helping you stay stay strong gary yorofsky was a massive inspiration to me in 2017 yeah. when he retired and he sort of said oh, i'm going to pass the baton on and i sort of took it upon myself like i like he saw it's like he spoke directly to my heart mm. and i know that gary had he spoke to a lot of people's hearts and a lot of people felt that way but through, through my journey it was when gary retired i was like mm. so sad and like yeah i was like i, I want to do something like gary did you know and then 2018 comes along and i'm all over the, the media speaking about animal rights mm. so but uh these days like i've had like people who aren't vegan inspire me and it's more like with me i need hard-lined men to like punch me in the face yeah. with their words yeah, yeah, yeah you know what i'm saying yeah like and and if... yeah like like andrew tate for example <laughs> <laughs> God, no. maybe when it comes to kickboxing or something but uh <laughs> um but uh david goggins was like one of in in 2019 i, I, f I found david goggins mm. online i can't remember how i found him maybe he was because he was on joe rogan or something mm. but uh yeah, like David Goggins uh, helped me with um, mental fortitude and just, he was basically just talking about like, because when you think about activism, right, you're basically doing something that's quite uncomfortable for a long mm. period of time. Yeah. You know? And when you're, when there's levels to activism too, like, yeah, you know, yeah. at, at the level that I'm at now, it's like I'm at the, the top level target <laughs> for people to come at, you know, yeah, on Facebook. Totally. I've got like, I got around 200 million views on social media now. So it's, it's, it's a lot and mostly on Facebook where I get most of my hate. Mm. So you, you have to, and also it's not just the, the people who are, it's, it's not the neutral non-vegans. It's the ones that are anti-vegan that come at me and they, they start commenting on the way I look or my past and, you know, just constant. It's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah. barrage of hate all the time. So I wake up in the morning like, oh, sun's shining, birds are chirping and you're a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit. You know, like yeah. it, it can it can bring you down. But so like, what you're talking about with activism is doing something that's uncomfortable, that can give you anxiety, putting yourself outside of comfort zones, out front mm. of slaughterhouses, talking to people, having debates, being criticized by sometimes your own movement, which is kind of the part that hurts like the most when it first happens. Like, you, yeah, you know, you get yeah. ostracized by your own movement and you're <laughs> like, it's like a survival thing. You've got to have some tribe. So when you get like ostracized by everyone, you kind of like, but with, with, with Goggins, he was talking about like, uh, you know, running marathons and, you know, basically not giving up and things like this. And so uh, Goggins was a big inspiration and there has been a few like along the way, but I think now I've got enough life experience, right? I've been, I've, I've been through enough mm. to be my own like coach right in a way right right like I, yeah so i've i've led led so many different lives you know i've been through sure. so many hard times and pulled myself out of so much crap that i don't really need outside inspiration yeah i get you i get you you're able to just get yourself through it with whatever you've got your your methods or whatever so what what does that look like then so say say i don't know say you get you had like a um you're feeling shit how so what do you do then like how, how do you make yourself feel better again if I'm feeling crap, I just usually write it out. Um, basically, um, sometimes there's not much you can do. I've been through bouts mm. of depression uh, recently. 2020, I had a two, two to three week bout of depression where I couldn't get out of the bed, and I was just like, oh god. And uh, I think it 
was seasonal depression in the UK mm. coupled with like overworking myself, massive anxiety was lockdowns stuff. Yeah, there was, was well, lockdowns. Right? But yeah, I think most people are going through something. Well, not, yeah, not the same, but you know, a lot of people are going through some shit, you know, at that point. Yeah. So yeah. I do understand what it's like to be crip crippled with depression, you know, especially yeah. when you think everything's going okay. Yeah. But these, yeah. I remember it starting to set in again in 2021, but I started like juicing again. Right. Okay. I said back in the days, I had the juice and I've done the juice. I forgot my roots, <laughs> yeah. my fruits. <laughs> so I started doing the green juices and I swear to God, like I was about to fall back into some type of seasonal depression and I started doing the green juices again and I just felt this mental clarity. And I was like, so, so a lot of it is to do with rest, mm. uh, nutrition, exercise. You know, if you get the fundamentals right yeah. and am I eating enough, you know, those, those fundamentals are basically, if you've got a strong base, things can come at you and they're not so hard. But if you don't sure. have your fundamentals, sleep and well, yeah. your juices or, or like some type of healthy food, healthy sleep, yeah, yeah. small things can happen and they can make, be like a mountain where it's like if you're in a good strong state of mm. foundation, it won't be so bad. I think exercise helps with that as well. You were talking about it earlier and you, you've been running a bit here as well. Like you ran a 10K the other day and things. I think exercise for me, you can tell me if you agree, especially if you're running long distance, you're doing something that takes a lot at, it's other things are not as serious if you can push your body to the point where you're like want to quit and keep going mm. then when something pops up you're like it's kind of like it's weird it's like oh I, yesterday i was mentally strong enough to do that now this problem is not really it's not as big of a problem yeah. you know what i mean yeah. i faced worse yesterday and mm. i'm fine right it's, yeah what it's, exercise can do is it can um get rid of your anxiety it can it sends you it's like an endorphin it's like a you know send some good feel good chemicals to your yeah. brain and it helps you sleep right and then so it, it flushes out your lymph and gets you sweating gets you moving you know what i mean mm. so yeah. like because what i do a lot of what i do was sitting at a desk mm. directing having meetings editing directing edits and social media and comments looking at them and so like a lot of when i'm out and about filming shooting mm you know, going into the farm, doing all this on the ground action stuff, my mental health is so much better. Like if I just, right. go, if I just been debating for four hours on the streets, I come back and I'm like, yeah, that was sick. What about that guy? How ridiculous, that I'm feeling good. But right. when, I, when you get me sitting down for two weeks trying to assimilate all the content and deal with social media, that's when I need to get out and get running right. and get, it's, yeah, screens. So with, with your story, man, and how, how mad it was in the beginning and how you came back from that and, you know, going through so much, such a mad transition, I, I don't know if anyone's ever asked you this or if you've ever spoken about it before, but a lot of people would have gone to God as the reason they got out of something like this. They would have gone religious, like really religious, right? Uh, it's, you, you must have met people. You must know people who've like, you know, found God and then they turn their life around and something like that. So what, what, do, you, what do you, spiritually, what do you, what do you believe? Oh, so... um that's a question huh yeah that yeah. is a question so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm me i'm a i'm quite agnostic um all i know is that my experiences to me person on a personal level make me believe in something else and it's because of like there's only so many coincidences that can happen for me before i start saying that's just an accident okay you know before i before i agree that it's an accident and start saying that maybe there's something more to this mm. like I don't know, just in my life, like I've, I've dodged so many bullets and I should have died, really. I should have overdosed. Like I used to try to overdose myself. Mm. I've been run over, nearly killed. I've been in situations where people have been wanting to kill me and it's just never happened, you know? Like I pulled myself out of some of the most dangerous, dangerous circumstances ever. Mm. And it's almost like just in the nick of time, mm. you know? And then when I went vegan, I went vegan spontaneously on world vegan day right. and turn out to be you know a pretty big animal rights influ like influence you know of mm -hmm. this sort of generation yeah you know so like these and that's not the only thing so a lot of things that i'll keep to myself but like for me i was like wow these these coincidences keep happening mm -hmm. okay. and 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 so like i start to think to myself is this played out is this kind of destined to happen is there some other force that I don't that we don't understand? In terms of like religion, I don't see any good coming out of religion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like that people believe books that are written by human beings, and human beings can be 
I I know for a fact how easily human beings can manipulate. Yeah. Human beings are corruptible. And uh, if they're human beings tend to be looking for ways to control other human beings. And mm. when I read, when I hear about people reading these books written by human beings, I don't understand why they would just blindly follow that. Mm -hmm. Like, cause if God wanted to speak to me, why wouldn't God just come and speak to me? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, and then there's all this, there's all these horrible things in books like that. It's, they're outdated. And you yeah, think if yeah. they were written through the eyes of God, they wouldn't be so outdated. And they'd be they would need of dating. <laughs> yeah, right? They'd just be always up to yeah. date forever. And yeah. I know there's yeah. going to be people that are going to be like, oh, go Joey, this is the, this is the word of God. I think if, if, if God does exist, then they would speak to you in, into your heart and they would guide you in a different way. Yeah. And maybe, so I'm, I'm less of the opinion that God doesn't exist because mm -hmm. I know people, there are some atheists who believe God d doesn't exist, but I think mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm, I live in the world of possibility because some atheists will be like, God definitely doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Some will be like, well, we can't prove he doesn't exist. We can't prove he does exist. They, they do exist, right? Um, but they always lean towards the not existing in their mm. rhetoric. Yeah. But I, I like to live in this realm of it's completely possible. But I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, the the biggest, the main kind of argument I've heard from from a, from atheists is that you could create a god right now, any god, the I don't know stuff Batman toy god, and nobody can tell you it doesn't exist. So this yeah. is this is the problem with kind of the um, the theist argument that like you can't prove it doesn't exist. Well, you can't prove my Batman God doesn't exist. No, like, do you know what I mean? But I'm with you in the sense of like, I think I'm pretty. For me personally, I would say I'm pretty sure that God, in the sense of like Christian God, Jewish God, Muslim God, whatever, all these different gods, Hindu gods, I'm pretty much, I, I'm comfortable saying I don't think they exist. But that doesn't mean I don't think there could be something else out there that you know what I mean. I'm open minded to being proven wrong on the idea of there being no god so i think i think we're more or less agreeing on that one and it's I, and just I, that it's just that when things have happened to me right. so significantly throughout my life yeah it's hard for me to go that was just luck bro well there's things we don't yeah. understand yeah, i think yeah. this is where we agree there's things yeah. that we can't explain yet and that we don't understand yet and maybe one day we will understand and maybe it will be something else that's been doing all of this stuff or maybe it will be science will be like no 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 actually it was all pretty explainable but that you know at this point we you know we're in a position mm. where we're all very unsure about it and i think for for me the main problem i have with religion and i think you probably agree with it as well is that i think the the whole concept of of um how we treat animals comes from mainstream religion actually and how humans are here and every, everyone else is here so that's I, I can't imagine any loving god would create that system um you know of torture mm -hmm. and suffering that we both see on a daily basis that's my, one of my major critiques of it which i know mm -hmm. you know, yeah the same yeah, yeah for sure yeah yeah there's definitely sure. horrible things in those books and i know yeah. that the human hand wrote those horrible things yeah you know so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I just like to live in the world of mystery. And I think my yeah. life has been a lot more, I, I've taken a lot more calculated risk because of that in a positive way. Okay. And I've believed yeah. in myself a lot more because of that. And I believed uh, that that I believe that if I didn't think like that, I might not have make, made such a big, a big change. It's because yeah, I believed yeah, it was possible to make a change. And I believe that, you know, that I'm being guided in some way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's, sure. that's what's taken me from like being a, I'll, I'll dabble in a bit of activism being like, no, nah, I'm going to commit to this and I know that right. I can change the world. Amazing. <clears throat> on the same on the same vein, I want to ask you questions you've never been asked before. That's why okay. I'm asking these questions, by the way. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you might not like this one. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not um, controversial, but it's just tough to answer. Um, two questions then. All right, then. Let's do it. What, what do you believe is the meaning of life, Joey Carbstrong? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been asked that in an interview or a podcast? I've never been asked that. <laughs> all I all I do know is that uh, it was the fear of death that got me off my bum to go do something with my life. Okay. Because I I'd wasted my life. I felt like I'd wasted my life, and I've le I'd left a, a just a dismal legacy behind, you know. And I was like, I, I remember going to sleep and waking up, and I, I don't know if you heard the saying, "Sleep is the cousin of death." Okay. No, no. So I'd wake up and I'd be like, "Is it? Did I just? Is that what it's going to be like to die?" Right. Okay. You know? Okay. And um, I was thinking of my family dying, my father dying. My father has passed away, and I watched my dad pass away, and just that I don't know what's going to happen when we die, mm -hmm. and uh, like, is it going to going to be like when before we were 
before we existed is it's going to be like nothingness and i'm scared yeah. of like nothingness for eternity so mm. i like to believe right that there's something else mm -hmm. i mean it might it might just make me feel a little less afraid or yeah. something like that so yeah. i don't know and there's probably no logic behind it but like yeah i get it but in terms of what is the meaning it would just be theory wouldn't it it would just be me popping a theory out there. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like, so, I guess, how you feel about it. it really, well, if, yeah. you, if you don't believe there's anything else after this, then there is no meaning to it. And that's a mm. scary thought. Um, there's right. things like we all just exist and we don't exist forever and there is no meaning. And that is a, that is a very horrifying prospect mm. that what, what matters then? You know, what, what, what does... It? I've had this discussion recently okay. and I was like, well, if we... Let's just say there's nothing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We die and there's nothing. Yeah. There's going to be, if you imagine a timeline, everyone dies here and this is the sentient life. Yeah. And this is them dying. And this is more sentient life being yeah, born yeah, into. Yeah. What matters is this sentient life while they're here, mm -hmm. right? They mm -hmm. deserve rights. They deserve not to live in abject suffering and horrible things happening to them. So like if I'm here and there's you, David Rams, right? We're in this little bubble here. Mm -hmm. And what we leave behind, right, will either harm or, or, or be neutral or help mm -hmm. this little the, sentient yeah, sure, sure. part of the timeline. Mm. So that doesn't necessarily mean this doesn't matter when we go. Mm. It still matters for those that are, that are, that are there. So sure. if I can leave something behind for mm. the sentient life that progresses on, then that would be a meaningful life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there is something else, though, <laughs> then I would say that if, let's just say we, we, we are spirit bodies and mm. we go somewhere else, right? Mm. We, 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 that means, must mean we, we come into this mm. for some reason. Mm. And I'd be like, well, why would we choose to come into this? And it's almost like I, I would see it like a, like a school. Right. <laughs> like you come in as a spirit. You forget that you're a spirit and you learn all these lessons and yeah. you become wiser and you leave lessons for other spirits here. And then when you come out, you're like, oh, wow, that was... That was all another another class at school or something, right, right. and now I'm wiser as a soul or something like a, a soul lesson or something like this. Right, maybe. right, right. <laughs> it's kind of like there's a the, what's that movie? There's a Disney Pixar movie. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they're all souls and they train them how to be human and they go down to earth and then they become human but they forget that they were a yeah. soul before. I don't know what movie that. What is that movie? You haven't seen this? No, no, no. You just like pitched like a Pixar movie. Yeah, well there you go. <laughs> I remember I wrote a, a, a rap about it like back in year 2003 or something right, probably right, still got right. a bit of paper somewhere but uh cool. yeah, otherwise i don't know what the meaning i don't think i think any, everyone could just theorize and it's probably like what it means to you or right, something right 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 i don't think a meaningless existence is a is a good sort of mindset to be in though it's an interesting know. one i like when you said uh <laughs> if, if there's nothing after death then then there's no reason to be here and that's that's a scary thought I, I feel like I, I like to flip that on its head. I don't think there is anything after death and I don't think there is any reason that we're here, but that's the beauty of it is that it's a blank slate. You've got nothing to prove to anyone. You are here right now and you'll be gone. And before you were here, there was no you for billions of years. And after you're gone, there'll be no you again. So you need to fucking step up. Like you, you can't just be sitting around doing fuck all. You, you are gonna be gone so quickly. So like you just said, if you wanna leave a legacy, no one cares about what they're going to care about. I mean, what I mean is no God cares about you. I don't believe that there's a God that's going to be like, you did well, you did bad. I don't think you're going to see Judgment Day. So your Judgment Day is now. It's right now. You need to be acting now because the ones who will judge you when you've gone, the ones who will actually remember you, they're here around you. They're not God, you know? Like, it's you. It's, it's, it's our partners. It's, it's the, the world, the millions of people you've spoken to. They're the ones that will remember and will pass it on. And they're the ones that are going to act or not act depending on what you did or didn't say. So for me, if I was to put a meaning on it, that would be the meaning, but it wouldn't be like, it is the meaning. You know what I mean? That, yeah, I that, that's what it's I would... a meaning. It's still kind of meaningless. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because in, in a spiritual sense, because yeah. Because when you get no the sentient life there, there, like further, long enough down the timeline, the, the, no one that ever has existed now uh -huh. will ever remember you or anything. But they will act in ways that remember you. So for yeah. example, like we treat, we, we now as men treat women with respect do we know who the first person was to start making people do yeah, that? Yeah, true. I don't know. You could leave an animal. We... So so basically, I've probably influenced people and you've influenced people that will never tell us that somehow this thought 
come out of my mouth, my brain, in, out of yeah. my mouth, into someone else who then publicize it to oh. other people. And then they bring up generations of children yeah. with this principle. Exactly. And then, yeah. So That's the entire reason culture. we're vegan. We're, we're vegan because someone did that. Like, yeah. I don't know, 50 years, it could be a hundred years ago. It could be, could be thousands of years Pythagoras. ago. Pythagoras. Literally. God bless if <laughs> Pythagoras. <laughs> Literally. That, that's the only reason that, you, you know, so it, it, it keeps going, doesn't it? And now you're doing what you're doing. And then who knows and if, if we don't blow the planet up, like in a hundred years, people won't be like, oh, Joey and David, but they'll be, they'll be doing stuff because of mm. the stuff that people like us were doing 100 years so ago. So even so if you believe that sentient conscious beings are important, mm. have value, mm. then you should leave a legacy behind even if there's nothing after death, mm. that if you should leave a legacy behind that that helps those conscious beings when they're the when they're here. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's that's pretty meaningful, even if you are an atheist and believe there's no God and For believe sure. there's no afterlife. For sure. Yeah, you know? definitely. Definitely. And what do you think is that, do you think it's very detrimental to believe that, hey man, we're only here, we're, we're here, but you know, we're going to heaven. So like, it doesn't really matter if we live this life or not, because we've got the afterlife, which is eternity. So we can yeah. just sit, kick our feet up and do nothing but read the Bible. Because, you know... Yeah, I mean, I think some Christians and, and some heavily religious people, they're some of the most driven, passionate people out there to get shit done because they want to be like a good Christian. So like, okay. I think it goes that way sometimes. Okay. Obviously, sometimes it goes the other way where they go and protest outside fucking whatever, you know, anti-gay and stuff like that, you know, LG, the anti-LGBT stuff. So they can go the other way as well, which really sucks. But then, you know, the same thing can be said of atheists. Like some of them go one way where they're just nihilists, like fuck everything, nothing has any purpose. I'll do whatever I want. I'm a selfish piece of shit. Or they'll yeah. go the other way where they'll be like, religion's wrong and I'm going to devote my entire life to doing good despite me, you know, despite yeah. what religion tries to do. Like, as in, they'll go, some atheists will make a point of being like, I can be good without God and I'm going to show you how good I can be, right? So, I don't know, I, I guess there, there are bad people and good people and across the You give a good person board, religion you know? and now focus on the good points and do good. So, religion mm. isn't all bad. I think it's mm. about the the individual's perspective on religion and what they use to, ju to justify their bad behavior. In right. Because, like, you can just take I mean, all the good parts about religion. You don't need to justify it. You yeah. just open the fucking Bible, Old Testament, you can do anything you want, practically. Yeah, yeah, okay, You know actually. what I mean? Fucking hell. Yeah, I'm not going to back any of that stuff up, that's Man, for sure. It's mad, uh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they tell us, like, oh, no, but New Testament is updated. It's like, it's the word of God, Who mate. updated it? <laughs> you know, it's like 80 stories in one book. I don't want to sit here ripping on, on, on the book. I actually tried to read it. Yeah. And I was like, wait, this God sounds a bit egotistical. Whoever written this. <laughs> <laughs> so he's gonna cast me down for not do with what they say if every five seconds if it's so, mad, it's mad. Yeah, yeah. But. it's mad. It's not just the Bible, it's most of these religious texts have this whack shit, you know, that they but um but it's yeah, it's it's because it was written by people thousands of years ago. It's it's fuck you take you take you take take something from never mind thousands of years ago, take something written by a some kind of philosopher or politician a hundred years ago, and you'd be like, oh my God, this fucker's evil. Like, you'd be like, what, what are they saying about yeah, women yeah. and gay people and disabled people? Yeah. Oh my God, like, lock them all away. Like, what, do you know what I mean? So it's like even like a hundred years ago. So is it any shock that things 2000 Thousand years, years ago? ago. <laughs> it's got to be a bit outdated. <laughs> a little bit like It was probably, probably very liberal for its time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this Bible is very, very it's leftist. Very, very progressive. <laughs> They're saying to uh, stone women rather than like whip torture them, them and torture them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, shit. <laughs> the progressive Bible. <laughs> yeah, back in two thousand years ago, mate. Yeah, God. Man, it's um, it's been cool to get into some topics that you'd normally not get into. Yeah, is there anything uh, yeah. you were coming here that you wanted to get into more that like I didn't get on to, get on for you? I don't often uh, consider these topics about uh, you know uh, the meaning of life, religion, and things like mm. this. Um, you know, I like to. I just like people to believe in themselves. Mm. Um, I think that you know you can kind of you're way more powerful than you think you are, and mm. I know that because I've been in like in such a horrible place, just filled with shame, just lying on the floor, a mess, wanting to die, thinking that I'm just nothing, you know what I mean? Mm. And now I like, people look up to me and, and are inspired by me and, you know, look to me for advice. Mm. You know what I mean? Because how does that, that feel? Like, like that? But that's a lot of people too. It's not just like one, because I, I have it occasionally, you know, but mm. for you, it's like, it's mm. on the daily, right? Yeah, I've got feel? amazing transformation stories of a stories of people that become activists, started organizations and changed lots of people, started YouTube channels and, you know, restaurants and 
you know, just they rescue animals now. They do, they do like so. I have in, in, inspired a lot of people to go on and do mm. a lot of good work, which is like if I could undo what I did back then. Mm. Like I think now with the power of social media and magnifying my my good work, I have. If you could calculate or measure the bad that I did and now the good that I've did in a consequentialist way, I think I've way like yeah exceeded yeah. you know that limit so but yeah like people who don't think that they can do what i did or like pull themselves out like th that's just a decision because mm -hmm. if you believe that you'll never take the action to pull yourself out of it so you do have to believe in yourself and you do have to believe that there's a way out and, and it is possible but you mm -hmm. have to take the action people try to put it in others hands and right. sometimes well most of the time the person with the best advice is yourself because you know yourself better and you have to like be not like pretty tough on yourself, like harder on yourself. Don't don't be such a. I don't know, man. Because if I stayed in that mindset, like oh, poor me, poor me, drinking alcohol, you know, like oh, this is so self-absorbed. Yeah. But now sure. when I thought thought of others and I looked at chickens in a factory farm suffering on their faces, mm -hmm. and no one cares mm -hmm. about a chicken, no one cares about a fish dying on a boat. Mm -hmm. Who cares? What, who's going to help them? Yeah. No one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Who's going to help the pig in the gas chamber terrified to they're dying, you know, suffering f in fear? Who's going to help the cow trying to escape the knockbox? Just some asshole with a bolt gun going to shoot him in the head. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, we have to. Yeah. We yeah. have to help them. You know, so... Did you read uh, there's a book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck? And uh, he makes this, po this uh, point in it. It's a really good point. He says that your problems aren't special. Mm. Like, you have bad problems and you have luxury problems mm. but it, you have problems you'll always have problems and, yeah. and this what you've just said about you know you go into your hole and feeling bad for yourself that this is how to get out of that is to realize that like other people don't have no problems they have different problems yours aren't special like, you need to remember that you're not special you're not special your problems aren't special nothing about you is special you are everyone else is going through the same or worse than you mm -hmm. And once you acknowledge that, that you're, you're all on a level playing field, basically, apart from obviously you know, some people like super rich or whatever mm -hmm. and born with a silver spoon. But you get my point. Most of us are in the same boat. And then you start to look like you say, you look at the chickens. Say, Wait a minute. My problems are my problems are fuck all compared to a chicken. My problems are fuck all compared to a cow's. Mm. And it, it, yeah, that can I can see how that could turn someone from your position around pretty fucking quickly when you start to, you know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. If you start thinking like, I want to help others. Mm. Right. That's what took it out of outside of myself mm. you know what i'm saying and i don't know if it's going to help anybody and everyone like i'm not a mental health doctor i'm not all i have is i've got experience my own experience and i know that when i mm. stop thinking and focusing on myself and my shame and what have i done and oh my god i might as well just not exist i started thinking who can i help should i help uh kids come coming out of gangs with drug uh, problems mm. should i help oh my god look at the who's helping these animals like I wasn't part of the animal rights movement at that point. I knew about Gary Orofsky. I knew like little bits and pieces, but I, I felt like they needed the help the most. And I don't know why I chose animals. I just that's just I just realized, oh my god, like look how many of them are suffering, and people make fun of it. Yeah, you know that's how far behind it. So that's that when I started generating my my you know skill set, my talent, my you know, my aggressive conduct <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> into defending the animals, I realized yeah. like, you know, this is what I, uh, I feel good doing. And this is what I, I think I, I was put here to do by the nothing God of nothingness. <laughs> <laughs> the meaningless, <laughs> the meaningless, meaningless nothing God that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> man, that's a fucking, I think that's a great point to close up, man. That was a really nice closing point from you it's been really cool to get into all this with you and ask you these these horrible questions because like they're not horrible i mean they're not horrible but they're hard right yeah yeah no that's they're been interesting I, th I appreciate you raising these questions with me yeah. um i uh you know i'm just putting my perspective forward it's pretty raw you, you know can disagree with it if you want <laughs> it's pretty raw i I've, I, pre I really appreciate like so many people would sit here with me uh, in your position with so many people you know with the fucking magnifying glass on you and they'd be like coy and they try to like oh dance but you just fucking gave it raw as it is and i think that's really refreshing from someone who's like you know a celebrity to sit there and be like i'm not gonna fucking hold back you know, and just say it how it is. Because there's a real, you're a real person, man. There's a fucking real life. There's people go through shit, you know? <laughs> like, there's no use hiding it, pretending it wasn't as bad as it was. Or it's no, it was actually worse you know? than I described. So right. I am actually bringing you the PG rated version of my life. And <laughs> <laughs> we're stick around for part two where we'll get into the uh, 18 plus version. Yeah, that's uh, after dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
It was awesome to have you here. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Closing remark? Something um, inspirational? Just keep going, you never give up. Awesome, man. Keep it simple. Appreciate it.